Hello, Michael Bettine here once again. And today we're going to do some actual playing. This is a companion piece to the recent Mechanics in Motion video. And this one is Mallets in Motion. So let's get right to it on its cup of time. Okay, today we're going to cover a couple of subjects. First off, I'm going to do some playing and further demonstrating the techniques that I showed in the Mechanics in Motion video. And then I'm going to talk about mallets and what to look for in mallets and choosing mallets and why you should have multiple mallets. So let's get to it right away here. So here's my favorite large gong mallet. This is the Vic Firth GB1. And I, I really like these because they have a very heavy head. So there's a lot of weight there. That can really help move you know, a large gong like this 32 inch Peisty here. And it's got a very long handle. But the way I mainly hold these is right in here. It's rare that I, I mean, I will never hold it way at the end and swing at a gong like this. That's, that's not what I do. I tend to hold them right here. And the reason for that is the balance. Uh, I find a real good balance here. Now I could cut these off and make them shorter, but I like the balance aspect of how they feel in my hands. So I generally will play them like this, holding them, you know, sort of halfway. But if I have to reach over, you know, I'll, I'll move up on the gong so I can be standing here. Here it can reach over here, or if I want to get the gong way over here, then, right, I'll hold it at the end so I can do that. But again, generally, I like to hold it here. And when I play the gongs, I like to be right up in them. I mean, you know, have my face right in there. I don't like to play the gongs from way back here. Only if I'm trying to listen to the room. Sometimes I'll back up so I can hear a little more of the room and what's going on out there and how the gongs are reacting in the room, how the sound is in the room. But generally, I like to be up close. So for most of this, you won't see any excessive arm movement. No swinging the, the arm like this. You know, it's all up close. So. Being up close, it's, it's all right here. It's the hands and the wrists. Maybe a little forearm, but again, I'm not doing this. No big motions, none of this. I watch videos of people and they're just like swinging the gongs, you know. They're just like, get the mallets going. And it's just like, I, maybe that's showbiz, you know. I think a lot of people do that for looks. I think some people actually teach that style just for the looks because it looks impressive. You know, you're doing all this dancing around and you get the gongs you're playing and the mallets are moving and yeah, it, it can look impressive. It's kind of show busy, but it's a lot of wasted motion, you know, moving like this. I challenge you to take a large gong mallet and do this for 10 minutes. <laughs> Your arm will be very tired and sore after that. So, as I talked about in the Mechanics of Motion video, I'm really about efficiency and being able to get, you know, a good sound with the least bit of motion. There's, there's no need to be doing all this sort of stuff. Now, later on, I'll be playing some things and you will see me use a little more arm on single strokes and then pull the mallet away, but that's, that's a whole different technique and we can talk about that 
then. But right now, when I'm generally playing, it's like this. And I'm close in. I'm not exerting much effort. And because the mallet is held up, you know, I'm not fighting against gravity. And I have a lot of control over both the sound of the gong and the volume of the gong. Now if I want to move over, all I have to do is move my hand over. And I might tilt it a little because it's not necessarily comfortable to be like this, but I might tilt it a little bit if I still want to stand here. If I move to the middle, then I can have them both upright. And again, if I want to reach way over, stretch out and move my hand down the mallet merely for reach and I'm using my arm just to reach my arm basically is there to move my hands and wrist to where they need to be so if I'm here I can take my arm my hand and wrist is over here if I have to go down I'll keep the same position but just rotate my arm down and in this case I might move a little bit so I can play this. If I want to get right here I can either go this way or move it the other way. Maybe I'll move over a little like this. But I'm basically keeping the same position but it's a rotation. You know if I'm going down Plane up. If I'm playing two on this side, I can do this. If I'm playing two on this side, I can do this. So that's sort of you know how, how this works. Now here's another real, real important thing, and I see a lot of people playing a two-tier setup like this: gong on top, gong on bottom. And they're up here playing away, and then they start playing the bottom gong, and they're still up here. Now I'm standing here, these top gongs are at my ear level, right here. And I'm hearing them. If I start playing the bottom gongs down here, that's all below my waist. So everything is shooting right past me. I can't tell what's going on down there. So what I like to do is I'll bend over. I want to hear what's happening with the bottom gongs, the, both the sound and how much volume there is. If I'm up here and I play it to where I want to hear it, it might actually be overpowering down there. And if you think about doing a gong session, if you have a floor full of people laying on mats, they're really in direct contact with the sound from your lower gongs. So I don't want to overpower them. So when we get to the demonstration and I'm playing, you'll see me bend over and I'll be like this. So I can, so I can tell, tell what's, what's happening, happening down, down there volume-wise. Volume -wise. And, I just, and I just don't see people do that. Do that. I see people standing, standing up, they're playing the top gongs and they hit a bottom gong and they're playing bottom gongs and they're not really paying attention or at least to me, paying enough attention to what's going on down there. And if I want to play both, you know, I'll get down like this. So I can hear what's happening with both of them. And I think that's really important. You should always know, you know, what your sound is. And again, sometimes I'll back up a little bit. I might stretch the mallets out a little back up so I can get more of a sense of what the sound field is and how it is out in space as opposed to me just being up close. I'll move back and forth 
Because it's always about listening. What is your sound doing in the room? And every room is different. The size of the room, the acoustics of the room, it's always different. And you need to be able to adjust your sound to the room. And I play rooms of various sizes. I play places that comfortably hold 10 people to large churches and cathedrals and community spaces where you can easily put, you know, 50 or 100 people in there. I have to approach each room differently. I can't, you know, if I'm playing in a, a big church that has a high ceiling and is very full of air, very expansive, I can play loud and the sound is going to carry and, you know, if and sound wonderful. But if I take that same process with me into a small studio with a low ceiling and there's 10, 12, 15 people in there and I play the same way I played in the cathedral, <laughs> it's just going to like blow the room away. So you really have to pay attention and listen to what you're doing every time in every space. All right, let's do some playing. I'm going to change mallets here. These are Mike Balter rollers. And one thing you'll see when I'm doing this is I like to, again, I like to hold them way up here. This gives me a lot of control. And if I need more volume, I can move down the shaft. And what that does, if we look here, I got it's very little swing on that, right? So I can really control it, keep the volume down. If I need more volume, I can back up a little. Now there's a little more swing. And what that does too, this is a heavy head. So there's more, you know, more weight being thrown at the gong. I can move down here. And there we go. We get a little more swing, even more weight. So that can help me bring up the volume. Conversely, if I want to control the volume and bring it back down, choke up on the mallet like that. So it's really about controlling your sound and knowing how to control it. So I like doing that and you'll, you'll see me during the playing here, I'll be moving my hands up and down to get different sound, different pressure on the gong, you know, to, to bring out different harmonics in that. So I have complete control. The other important thing to notice is I am not using all this arm motion again. It's all here. Wrist, fingers, hand. And I'm not hitting very hard. Really not much harder than this. But if I adjust my swing, you can see I'm not, I'm not really changing how I'm playing it, but I'm letting physics take over and letting the mass of the head get a little more throw and I can get more power into it without having to do this. So I'm going to play a little bit here and watch for those things. And then we'll talk about what I did.
Okay, let's look at some of the things I did there. When I want just the deeper body tone of the gong, I'll tend to play right about here, just a bit under center. And what happens is I'm playing here. I'm really only activating this area of the gong. This outer part is not vibrating that much. So that's why I can get the deeper note. Like that. Now as I move out words, you'll notice I, I took the mallets and I moved outwards. Now I'm starting to bring in overtones because I'm activating more of the gong. I'm getting the edge to vibrate more. So you notice it'll go from just being the focused deeper note, fundamental note, and as I move out I get the overtones coming in. to move. We're here in the middle. The edge is pretty stationary. But now you can see vibrations you know in the, in the whole edge there. So I'm able to control my sound from the center moving outwards to bring in some overtones, moving back in if I want to kind of dampen that down. If I'm out here, now if I really want to get things moving, I, I want to activate the whole face of the gong. This is a big piece of metal. This is 32 inches. It's a lot of metal. It's different than a very small gong where you hit it and the whole thing will just open up because it's very small. I want to get this whole thing open, I have to really, I want to move around. So I might move in sort of these um, moon shaped half circles, whatever you want to call them, like this. That's going to get more of the gong engaged. up. We get a lot of high harmonics. The gong s s sort of blossoms. The sound blooms and blossoms there. Now another thing you might have noticed when I was playing before is what I call a stutter stroke. And basically I'm taking the same motion but instead of keeping it in one place I'll move my hand up and down or in and out quickly. And again, I'm using the arm just to move the hand around. I'm not, if you notice, I'm never doing any of this big arm motion here. But I'll do this. there. So I'll do this stutter stroke when I really want to get things going quickly because I'm rapidly moving between different parts of the gong and getting the whole face activated. So again, for me, everything is about control. Controlling the sounds that I make. Also knowing what sounds I'm going to make. I. I I watch videos of some people and they just seem to be just kind of like yeah. they're just randomly hitting the gongs. 
they're not paying attention. And again, in my, a lot of times it's with all this twirling around and arms. And, yeah, it's kind of a showbiz thing, okay. But for me, uh, that's not my style. If you like doing that, that's fine. I like to know what's going to happen when I strike a gong because each gong will have sweet spots. Generally, your three main sweet spots are in the center where you get that focused note. The actual pitch of your gong. And then just a little off center, possibly halfway, where you start to get the overtones. And it opens up more. And then, not on the edge, but kind of right on the the edge of the ring here, where it opens up even more. So those are the three main sweet spots. And I don't know if you can see it in the video, but there's a spot right here worn into the lacquer that you can tell that I play there a lot. And then right here too. So you can tell where I play this gong all the time by where it's worn. So I have a spot here and a spot here. It actually kind of goes all the way around here. So those are your three main spots. The center, just off center, and not quite at the edge. Now one thing I've noticed is there are differences. Like if I play down here, it's different than playing up here. And that be that's really because of the chord. The chord holds this top part of the gong and keeps it from vibrating as much as the bottom part of the gong. So there is a difference. That's why I generally play down here because it allows the gong to open up more. Where here, it keeps it from vibrating as much and it doesn't open up. I don't know if we can really hear the difference, but let's see. There's some difference there. And it also feels different in playing it. The gong, partly because it, it can swing here, where if I'm pushing here, it's not going to swing as much. I feel more give playing down here. Another aspect of that is if you want to play hard and heavy, if you want to put a lot of muscle into the gong, but you don't want to have it end up swinging wildly, is play up here more because it's not, it can't get that big swing. So I can be playing, like if I'm playing down here, I can get the gong moving and with successive strokes, it might be swinging back and forth. Or up here, doesn't develop this sort of swing, but it develops more just like this, as opposed to this. So that's another thing to think about. Playing up here, you get less swing. So if you're really laying into the gong, you might want to play more above center to give you more swing control. So what happens when it's swinging? Well, you can do various things. I'll take my hand, I might just put it behind like this, not actually grabbing it, but just putting it behind, so I'm not so much muffling it, but I can control how far back it's coming. Or, if it's moving, I can take the mallet and just gently stop it from swinging. So various things like that. 
All right, let's play some more here. And again, watch how I'm using the mallets and that it, there's, there's none of this, none of this big arm stuff going on. Okay, so here I am with the large mallets. A little more arm movement in some of this, but it's more just coming off the gongs. And that's from my percussion training of, of you know, pulling off the instrument. So it's not anything other than I'm getting away from the gong after striking it. I'm not coming here to strike it. I'm still here pulling off of the gongs and then I often like to back up so I can hear what's going on hear the sounds and listen to how they open up in the room listen to what's going on so again economy of motion it's really important Let's look at one other way that I use a lot, and that's playing on the edge. Now I've had people say, oh, don't play on the edge, you can hurt the gong, you can break the gong, and things like that. Well, this gong is 20 years old. I've been playing on the edge for 20 years. It's still perfectly fine. This gong is about 40 years old, and it's still fine. Um, the thing is, don't play on the edge of a gong with a really hard, hard mallet and beat on it. Yes, you could bend it in the case of a, a peisty gong. You could bend it, but there's no need to ever hit gongs that hard. But I like to play the edge because it really activates just the nice frothy 
you know, white noise sort of highs. So there we go, if you have an edged gong, don't be afraid to play on the edge. As you can see, I wasn't playing any harder than I play anywhere else. So they're using the rollers. You could also use something like a marimba mallet here. As you can see, right away, that's getting just even more highs, less lows, because Again, it's a smaller mallet. There's less mass there. There's less weight. Here, I can activate more of the gong and bring out a little more lows. Now with this, it'll just bring out the highs. There's not enough mass, like in this one, to get the whole gong going. So that brings us to part two, talking about mallets and different mallets, why you need different mallets, and what to look for when you're buying mallets. When I started out back in the 70s, basically, there were the various peisty mallets, which had wooden handles back then. Uh, Ludwig had a metal handle gong mallet, just one model. I think Peisty had maybe three models back then. And then if you could get some sort of Asian gong, you might have gotten either the cloth wrapped mallet or the kind of um, yarn um, macrame sort of mallet like you find in some of the uh, Indonesian gongs and that. And that was really it for mallets. Not a lot of choice. Today, I mean, if you go on any gong dealer website and click on mallets, you will be just hit with unbelievable amount of mallets you can choose from. And you look at those and you're like, what do I buy? I want to get another mallet. How do I choose mallets? So let's look in to mallet design and you know, how to decide what you might need for another mallet. So first, let's go back to the Vic Firth GB1. This is a good example. It's, it's just a, a big-headed, padded mallet. There's a lot of other ones out there like this. And here's with something like this. It's got a lot of weight. It's got a big head. And the important thing is it's got a big, flat side. So when you are actually contacting the gong, there's a lot of mallet touching the surface quite a bit. I mean, it curves off a little here, so the main part is probably here. It's, it's like, what, three inches or so. That's what's actually contacting the gong. And that's what will help you get a big sound, a more immediate sound on a large gong. And it's important to have a size-appropriate mallet, too. You don't want to have a 50-inch gong and have a little tiny mallet. I had somebody ask me that question once. They sent me an email. They said they, they've got this really nice gong. I think it was an earth gong like this, a 32 or 38 inch. And they said, I, I really don't like the sound. 
And I wrote back and said, well, what are you playing it with? And they said, well, I'm using a timpani mallet. And if you're familiar with a timpani mallet, it's got a little head like this, a little what they call a cartwheel head or a ball head. Very small, so they're not getting any sound out of it because it's a real small mallet. That'd be like trying to get a deep sound out of this with a marimba mallet. It's just not going to happen. Whereas if I use the appropriate size mallet, yeah, I'm going to get the sound I want. So that's the first step. You, you just have to have the right mallets. So everybody should have a, a big padded mallet of the appropriate size for whatever gong or gongs they own. That's important. So let's look at another type here. Here's a yarn wound. This is an old Mike Balter GM3. I want you to notice the difference in the head. And the first thing you can notice is the striking area is much smaller on the yarn wand. Here's our striking area here. Here's the yarn wand. Our striking area is very much here. And you can even see how it's lighter. The yarn is lighter where I've been playing it all these years, right around this circumference here. It's worn there. It's a harder one. It doesn't have as much padding. And it's got a very small, comparatively smaller area to this mallet. So it's not going to be capable of getting as deep a full sound as the large padded one. And, and you could also hear there's more attack because it's a harder mallet. But I'll use these for different reasons. If I really want a more percussive sound, I'll pick something like this. Or if I'm moving between things, like I have my bell plates over here, if I had to move between different instruments, I might I might pick something like this because it's going to be a little more versatile, whereas hitting a bell plate with this, it overpowers it and it doesn't get any sound. So there's you know there's different reasons to have different mallets. So let's look again. Here we have yarn wound marimba mallets. These are Balter 13Bs, one of my favorite mallets I use for a lot. And B just means birch handle. I like a birch handle. These are great on bowls and bells in smaller you know, metal percussion like that. They'll work nicely on the bell plates, on the Ogororo plates. Here's a large Nana bell. I've got some bell cymbals here. Or even on a Burma bell if I need to, although I tend to like a harder mallet on a Burma bell. So I like these a lot, it's very versatile, but using them on gongs, uh, yeah, I might play them on the edge like I demonstrated before if I really want to just get that frothy white noise sound. Or I might play them if I want like in the middle to get that really high bell type note. But I tend to mainly use these on percussion. If I'm playing experimental or improvised music, then I'll, I will use these on gongs more because I'm looking for different types of sounds and not necessarily the depth of the sound. 
Here's a rubber mallet, sort of a corresponding, this is a medium and this is a medium. And you'll notice again, the, the plane surface here versus the plane surface here. And on this yarn wound, you can see where it's worn. We've got a little lighter blue going around here. And on this too, you can kind of see there's a little lighter spot going around the middle of that. It's harder and there's less contact with the instruments. I like these on singing bowls and rin bowls especially. I think they bring out the sound really well. I like them on the work on Burma bells and the bell cymbals. On the gong you're going to get that really just percussive bright sound. This is probably not something I would do for a, a gong session, but when I'm playing improvised music, the rules are completely different. So I will use this a lot to just get different sort of sounds out of it. Let me just show you. I had this in a different video when I was talking mallets, but here's my mallet bag. I mean, you can see, I mean, I've got all types all sizes and shapes. Here's a Vic Firth GB2. Let's take a look at that and compare it to the GB1. First off, it's much lighter. The weight is possibly half of the bigger one. And notice the plane surface. We've got maybe two inches, two and a half inches versus almost twice as much on the other one. This is good for smaller gongs, like 24 inch, 20 inch. Not so much on a large gong, it'll work. But I prefer to use something like this on a large gong, but on a, here's a 22 inch gong. Perfect for that, 22, 24, 26. Here's a 26 inch, 28 inch. But for bigger, heavier gongs, I prefer a bigger, heavier mallet. So again, it's having the appropriate mallets. So if you've got a, a 38 inch gong and you have a 28 inch gong and you have just one mallet, it might not be the best thing you probably want a couple different sizes, one more appropriate for the 28, one more appropriate for the 38. And also, what are your gongs made of? If you have stainless steel, or nickel silver, or bronze, that can make a difference too. How heavy is your gong? A lot of stainless steel gongs tend to be fairly thin. I wouldn't necessarily play it with a one this large, I might choose something a little smaller because this might overpower it. Whereas bronze gongs, typical Chinese gongs like this sun gong, they're really thick. They're really heavy. So you need some muscle to get all this mass going. So now somebody's going to write in and say, you didn't prime that gong. I rarely ever do that. For those of you who don't know what priming in is, priming is tapping the gong lightly to get, the, get it vibrating so that when you hit it on the note, when you hit it harder, it should open up. the gong is already vibrating as opposed to if it's still and you hit it. I've had people write into me before about this. Uh, as you notice, I don't ever whack the gongs. I don't hit them that hard. So for me, I'm not going to break anything. I know people have written in and said, you could break your gong if you don't prime it and you know you hit it. It's like, well, you can break your gong if you overplay it. If you 
take a hard heavy mallet and hit it really hard and overplay it and put your whole body into it yeah you could break it whether you prime it or not I, when I'm playing I don't have time to prime the gongs as you saw in the, you know when I was playing earlier I'm moving from gong to gong it's not like I can be playing here and I want to play the earth gong and I think well I better prime it here get it going a little bit okay then I'll move over I don't have time for that honestly now if I was in a symphony orchestra and I'm playing a piece and there's one big gong strike I have to do and I have the big gong here and it has to open up on that note it's not like I got to hit it and here's one two three four one and the crash comes afterwards I don't want that so if I'm in the symphony and I have to have it open up like on the one I will prime it get it vibrating a little and it, you just get it so so nobody else is hearing it and then it comes one two three four one and the gong opens up on time that's a whole different story I don't know how many of you people out there play in the symphony orchestra or a civic orchestra or band or something where you have to play one gong hit and it has to be in time with the music priming that's when you should do it if you're playing a gong session or you're playing experimental music improvised music or whatever there is no timing in what I do. The timing is me. I decide the timing. So uh, it doesn't matter. And again, I don't have the time to warm up a gong before I hit it because I'm moving between these gongs, these bells, all the other instruments I have in front of me on a table. I don't have time to do that. So save your postage. You don't have to write me a letter about you didn't prime the gong because I never do that okay let's just look at a couple more mallets here just to get some ideas so here's three of them I like to use and compare them to a marimba mallet and each one is successively a little bit larger so you're gonna get a little more plain surface here a little more here this one's fairly rounded so you're not getting much more plain surface but it's got more mass to it and you'll get more energy you'll get more oomph out of it so I have all kinds of mallets of different sizes and shapes in order to be able to bring out different sounds now sometimes I hear sounds in my head and if I can't find a mallet to come up with that sound I will develop my own in the case of my uh, gong hammers here hammer of the gongs uh, I took a chime mallet and I put a very heavy felt end on it sometimes I'll play gongs with this mainly uh, tuned nipple gongs or any of my bossed gongs because this is great for striking the boss of the gong let me grab one here here's a small dream M bow gong very percussive bright sound on the boss that will work and I can play my other gongs with it but I don't generally do that I say this more for the nipple gongs or for things like Burma bells I use the other end Burma bells are traditionally struck with a wooden mallet and struck on the corner. So I like to use this. And I can also use it on cymbals to get that percussive sound. Bell plates, 
So it's having the appropriate mallets. That's the important thing. But don't just run out and buy all kinds of mallets. You know, take your time. But one thing I tell people is they'll say, well, I need to get another gong so I have more sounds. It's like, well, instead of just running out and buying another gong, buy some more mallets. That will give you more sounds. So if you only have two mallets, get two more. Then you've got four mallets and you've got so much more sound possibilities and potentials. And you know, you can mix them up too. You can play two different ones. same in your hand or things like that. Use different ones to get different sounds. But if you want to change your sound, change your mallet. That's the best advice I ever got from one of my teachers. Change your stick or mallet if you want more sounds, different sounds. And it works. And as you can see by my stick bag, I have all kinds of mallets. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I have boxes literally you know those big bins those big rubber made tubs i have probably five of those full of mallets that i've collected over 40 some years i always keep them and you know when they wear out some of them i rewrap and make new mallets out of so there we go mallets in motion different ways to play, different techniques using that mechanics and motion technique. So I hope this has helped, giving you some ideas, some food for thought, and things that you can, you know, take right away to your gong and practice that way and try out these ideas. And I encourage you to try these out, and if they work for you, that is great. If they don't work for you, that is great also. Each of us is different. And it's important for us to find what works for ourselves. And that's what my explorations have done over all these years. And I continue to explore finding new sounds and new ideas. And if I find a better technique or a better idea, I, I change to it because that's just the way it works. I'm, I don't want to be stuck in something. If there's something better, I want to move to that and use the better thing. Okay, we will see you next week on It's Cup of Time.